Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you, Leo, for this very, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be uh, here to speak to the Ambassadors Club. I will uh, share with you some of my thoughts on uh, the war of ideas and hopefully leave enough time for questions so that we can engage with each other on uh, the war that hopefully uh, you will be waging to win. So, a little bit of where, uh, where I see ourselves. The recognition that Israel right now is engaged in a war of ideas, that Israel is engaged in a battle for its legitimacy, took some time to sink in. Uh, as you know, for a very long time, the notion of the threats to Israel was primarily a physical one. It is still generally the lens through which we think about threats such as they are to Israel and its existence. We think about them in terms of physical threats. Our leadership in Israel has been forged through the lens of these physical threats and in fighting them and combating them. So for a very long time, the idea that images, words, narratives matter, and that this is not just something about our image, how we're perceived, uh, do people like us or not, but that this is in many ways a, a full-blown war, uh, this is something that took a while to realize, and I can tell you from my perspective uh, it certainly was considered for quite a while by our leadership as a fluffy, girly stuff. You know, there's the real serious stuff of tanks and airplanes, and these are the, the serious threats. And the question of the ideas, the narrative, uh, the images, the words, that's, that's for the girls. In many ways, the question of uh, the handling of the flotilla and the marmara was a negative, decisive element in shifting the thinking of our leadership about this issue. And ever since, there is a substantial recognition of what's going on. Now, let me just kind of take a step back and say what I think is going on from a historical perspective and bring us to the present. At the core, the idea that is Israel, the idea that the Jewish people are a people, and that as a people, they have the right to self-determination, and that the right to self-determination should be exercised in the only land in which they were ever sovereign, and to which they maintained an ongoing spiritual and emotional connection, the essence of that idea, which you know is Zionism, that idea was never accepted in this region. It has also never been accepted even wider in wider areas, but certainly in this region, it was never accepted. Even when there is a, a willingness and acceptance of negotiating with Israel, making peace with Israel, uh, making some kind of territorial compromise with Israel, the idea itself is still rejected. And it tends to be rejected on several levels. One uh, that I find most frequently is the Jewish people are not a people. You are only a religion, and as a religion, And as a religion, you don't have the right to self-determination. A denial, another form that it takes is a denial of the historical connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And another form of denial that it might take is that even if this idea does, might have some merit, it causes too many problems uh, to be considered justified. So this idea was always rejected. But the form of battling against this idea have changed over the decades. First of all, it was a battle 
to even make this idea acceptable and to make it acceptable to the colonial powers. In 1917, this idea became acceptable to the most important colonial power at the time, uh, Great Britain. So from 1917 to 1937, the battle against Zionism transforms into a battle against immigration, against Aliyah. All of the battles, and some of them were successful, were to limit the immigration into Israel under the British mandate, and to prevent the coming into being of a sovereign Jewish state. That battle fails in 1947 with the United Nations decision to grant to Jews a state. The idea gets rejected, and the fact that those who reject the idea have failed in preventing immigration ultimately and in preventing Israel from coming into being does not mean that they end the battle. They mean merely transform it into a new phase, which is now one of militaries. And from 1947-48 and until 1973, the greatest threat to Israel is military invasions from its neighbors. By 1973, Israel is able to defeat that threat as well. 1973 is the last military war that Israel wages and is able to ultimately convince its neighbors that they will not succeed in defeating the Zionist idea and in annihilating the Zionist idea through military invasion. Again, this does not mark the end of the battle. From 1973 on, we see the battle mutating into two main efforts. One, economic. This is the beginning of the height of the Arab boycott, the use of petrodollars to strangle the Israeli economy. And this is also when we see the main uh, period of international terrorism and later domestic terrorism. Now, of course, all of the things that I'm saying also uh, take place in other uh, times. But all in all, this is what the 70s and 80s are all about, and later the 90s with a lot of domestic terrorism. But again, Israel is able to defeat that uh, threat, first by building an innovative export-based economy that pretty much leaves the economies of the region in the dust. And Israel is unique among the nations in not trading with its neighbors. Even in a globalized world, the trading patterns of all countries are heavily weighted towards their neighbors. Israel is the only country that is not heavily weighted, in fact, almost none, with its neighbors, and basically trades with North America, with Europe, and the Far East, but nothing in the region. So Israel builds an innovative export-based economy and ultimately is able to free itself from the dangers of uh, economic strangulation. Even with terrorism, Israel ultimately figures a way to put terrorism at bay. This is not to say that there are not efforts uh, to mount terrorist attacks, but Israel's citizens are no longer terrorized, and that is ultimately the purpose of terrorism. So this brings us to the present with a mounting set of failures to undermine Zionism, undermine or even annihilate Israel and Zionism. Again, this does not mean that those who reject Zionism basically put their hands up in the air and say, you know what, we've tried so many times in so many ways, we failed, so I guess we have to make our peace with it, uh, our peace with it in the very fundamental uh, sense of accepting the idea. What you have is now a mutation of the battle into a new arena, and that is the arena of ideas. And this arena has several sub-arenas, whether it is diplomatic, whether it is NGOs, 
whether it is academia in terms of an intellectual battle or the campuses, the battle for the hearts and minds of students. This is a war that takes place in supermarkets in Britain and of course in the media and in the social network, numerous sub-arenas that all of them are about ideas, narratives, stories, images, and all of them are non-violent. Now, this almost begins to sound good, because when we think of a non-violent struggle, when we hear that those who oppose Zionism say, we have chosen the path of non-violence, most people in the world would think Gandhi, would think Martin Luther King, we associate nonviolent struggles with something that is good. But if you think about it a little more than the intuitive response, there's absolutely no connection. You could have a violent struggle for a very noble cause, and you could have a nonviolent struggle for a very ignoble cause. And this is what we have here. This is essentially a non-violent struggle, still fit with the purpose, the same initial purpose of 100 years ago, of undermining and delegitimizing the Zionist idea. Now some of you might say, and this is also the reason that our leadership for a while thought that these were girly, fluffy stuff, that as long as the struggle is non-violent, that's good. You know, as long as the non-violent struggle replaces the violent struggle, it's fine. And there theoretically is something to that, but I will tell you why I look at this non-violent struggle as deeply disturbing. Except for the fact that I personally am a person who believes in the importance of ideas to shape reality. A nonviolent struggle about narratives and ideas cuts to the core of what makes Israel strong. Now, if you think about what Israel is, Israel is first and foremost an idea, long before it's a physical reality. Israel is a country that was born of the mind. Israel was envisioned, written about, dreamt about, uh, planned for, it was an idea long before it became a physical reality. In fact, young people were motivated, inspired by this idea in order to come here and create the physical reality that you know as Israel today. Now, if this idea is undermined, if this idea begins to lose its power, if all of you and all of us lose faith in that idea, physical reality will ultimately follow. So the defense of the idea that is Israel against the efforts to attack it and undermine it is critical to the future of Israel because it does attack what is most precious and unique and what makes Israel strong. So if this is indeed what we are facing, then the question is, what is the response? And the response, like all the other times, is to fight the threat and handle it and take it heads on. And that means, first and foremost, identify the threat. And I think at least the fact that you are here, the fact you said it's the largest program ever, the fact that Stand With Us exists, the fact that other organizations exist, I think today in the Israeli leadership, in the Jewish community, in the Friends of Israel community, there is an understanding, a realization that indeed this is a real threat, it's a strategic threat, and there is a battle uh, being waged. Having identified the challenge, the threats, and the nature of the battle, we need to begin, to begin to carve the responses to it. First of all, we need to put the resources behind it. 
In Israel, the budget of the defense ministry is 60 billion shekels, give or take, as they said. The budget of the foreign ministry is 1.6 billion shekels. As the foreign ministry likes to say, they have global challenges and a municipal budget. This is clearly not appropriate to the kind of challenges that we're facing. It reflects a world where physical challenges are paramount, but it's not where we're heading. So clearly this needs to change in terms of the allocation of resources. We need to put together the organizational structures to win this war. Uh, my uh, little fantasy of an organizational structure is called the IIDF. I say that just as the, the, we have established the IDF for our physical threats, the Israeli Defense Forces, we should have the IIDF, the Israeli Intellectual Defense Forces that are dedicated to the intellectual defense of Israel, and hopefully uh, you see yourselves all as soldiers in the IIDF. And what needs to characterize the IIDF, contrary to the IDF, is that it's not a singular hierarchical structure. It needs to be, I'm sorry? No. It needs to be uh, networked. It needs to be able to bring together a foreign ministry of official, an ambassador, and a young person of 15 with a computer living in Canada who has a great idea. So we need to be able to bring together all the resources and tie them together, also to be able to exchange knowledge. Because, for example, responses that emerge in campuses to one challenge should quickly be conveyed to other campuses as best practices in order to implement that. So we need to put together the structure that is befitting the nature of the challenge. And we need to develop a doctrine to win. One of Israel's most fundamental military doctrines, given its small size, was that as soon as possible, Israel needs to take the battle to the other side's territory. We need to do the same in the intellectual war. One of the things that we have done for too long is to be on the defensive. We stop initiatives from the other side. We respond to them. But we never, or hardly never, initiate or mount our own counterattacks. And this is something that we need to start doing. I'm currently now in the process of, any of you want to come and volunteer and to work on this project? Uh, now I'm in the process of building um, a campaign that deals with the question of UNRWA and the inflation of the number of refugees as an obstacle to the achievement of peace. But it's merely one example and there are many that we could use. So develop a doctrine that as a key element talks about going on the offensive. And finally, we need to have a few fundamental arguments or bodies of arguments. The first is to stop to try to win the battle of who's the greater victim. One of the things that we've been playing for a long time is to try to show to the world that we suffer more, or that we suffer as much, or that life for us is hard and that we sacrifice. This is not going to fly. We need to come to terms with the fact that physically we are strong and people are not going to buy us as the, the victims and those who suffer. We need to be able to change the conversation from who's the greater victim to who has shown greater responsibility in shaping their fate. I can tell you that as a proud Zionist, I don't think we have come to this country uh, in order to win the battle of who's the greater victim. What we have shown and what makes Zionism so remarkable is that it is a movement of people who have chosen to take responsibility and shape their own fate. 
the question of responsibility, of being a future-oriented rather than a past-oriented people is something that we need to do in terms of changing the conversation. Parallel to that, or close to that, we need to move away, as harsh as it sounds, from the Holocaust as the thing that justifies Israel. For too long, uh, we have told the story that Israel exists because of the Holocaust, and we have told it because it was easy and powerful. There is almost no simpler, or for a very long time, there was no simpler way to get the other side to shut up than to mention the Holocaust. But see what it has happened, what it has caused. Because there are so many who are determined to undermine Israel and Zionism, it has led to two trends. The first is the increasing denial of the Holocaust as an effort to undermine that which seems to give Israel its power. And the second is to talk of the Palestinians as the secondary victims of the Holocaust. I don't know how many of you have heard this argument, but it's quite common, especially in uh, European circles. And the, and the story goes like this. Yes, we the Europeans have uh, made, you know, we have committed a great sin, but uh, as a result of trying to resolve or to make amends for that sin by creating the State of Israel, we have created an even greater sin, or a great sin, as great, because the Palestinians are now stateless and they suffer. And to the untrained ear, this sounds very reasonable. Yes, they tried to find a solution for those Jews, whatever Jews remained, they threw them somewhere in the Levant, in the Middle East, the Palestinians suffer as a result, and that's the story. The danger in this argument is that it runs contrary to everything that Zionism is. It makes Israel the result of, it's not that Zionism was a movement who t of people who took responsibility. It's not that Zionism started in the 19th century as a result of people's aspirations. It was, it's not that the Jewish people have a historical connection with the land of Israel. It's just that the Europeans, to atone for their sins, threw these people who are not capable of being agents of their own faith in that area, and the Palestinian tragedy ensued. So we need to remind people of the history and story of Zionism. I can tell you that uh, a couple years ago, I was asked to give a briefing to a delegation of Democratic members of Congress. And I was asked to give a briefing about the history of Zionism. And I gave a very straightforward, in my view, brief. And at the end of it, the head of the delegation, the senior Democrat uh, in the delegation and in Congress, basically said, I don't get it. When you talk about Zionism, it sounds so nice. So how come it has such a bad reputation? And people don't know anymore the history of Zionism, the story of how it started. I have here another little fantasy which um, that, I don't know, Spielberg or someone of that caliber will make a movie about Herzl's life. I don't know how many of you have read Amos Elon's book about Herzl. It paints a remarkable character. And people need to go back and remember that story of how Zionism was envisioned and created and the institutions for it. It's a remarkable story of a people who take their fate into their own hands, and we need to remind people of that story. So these are some of the things that I think we should do in combating this. And the last thing is that we need to plan for this, as we did for all the other battles, as something that would take two or three decades to win. And we can win. I know that in many ways today, victory is a word that people no longer use. Winning is no longer used. 
But ultimately, this is what we need to aspire for. And we can uh, win this. It will take time. Uh, but we can also look at it as a remarkable opportunity. If you think about how Israel has been able not only to triumph, but also to prosper from meeting all those challenges, to become the startup nation, to reach amazing achievements because it had to deal with serious challenges, this could be the beginning of a remarkable renaissance of Zionist learning, of people going back and learning about the history of Zionism and reacquainting themselves with that, of people acquainting themselves with Israel and having a relationship with this country and becoming more acquainted with its complexity. We should be turning east. A friend of mine says that for every person we lose in Berkeley, we can win 10 in India and 100 in China. There's tremendous sympathy there for Israel and the Jewish people for what we've achieved here. This, these are the countries of the present and the future. We should go there. We should get basis for our legitimacy, for our support there. So this could be a tremendous opportunity for renaissance for everything that has to do with Zionism and learning about Israel and the status of Israel and its standing among the nations. And ultimately, if you think about it, right now it seems frustrating sometimes, but if there is one war and one battle that the Jewish people should be able to win, it's an intellectual war. So this is, uh, oh, these are some opening remarks for you as the Ambassadors Club, and I'll be very happy to take questions. Please. You must have said Zionism about 50 times, and not once you didn't mention that, and not once you mentioned that um, the root of Zionism is the Bible. And it comes from the Bible, and you, I find it kind of disturbing that you didn't mention that. Uh, I think I did mention, just not by mentioning the word Bible, I mentioned the, the fact that this is the only country in which the Jewish people were ever sovereign and to which they maintained the historical, spiritual, and emotional connection. But ultimately, we do need to remember that Zionism was a secular movement that drew its inspiration and its historical basis from the connection between the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and the Bible, but all what, what made Zionism was so, so special and what made many very religious people so angry with Zionism is precisely that it decided not to wait for God and to take responsibility into the hands of people and to make the reality happen. I mean, the brilliance of Zionism is that it took a messianic idea of to next year in Jerusalem, which before Zionism no one thought would ever take place before the Messiah came, and it turned the idea of to next year in Jerusalem into a political program. Please. You said that uh, Israel should stop using the image of the victim in its uh, uh, public diplomacy efforts. Would you say that most of the public diplomacy efforts of Israel has today is still revolving presenting Israel as the victim, or is it mostly showing Israel as a progressing, innovative country that has a lot to offer? It's true that in the last couple of years, as part of some rethinking, uh, there are a lot of uh, thinking about rebranding Israel. I'm sure you've heard some talks about that. Um, what uh, Saul Singer and Dan Senior have done for Israel with their book of Startup Nation, uh, century, I mean decades of foreign service professionals have not done. Uh, so clearly, especially as we go east to India, to China, um, to many other places that do not care about the conflict, the image of Israel is a place uh, that is edgy, that is interesting, that is exciting, that is innovative, uh, that is progressive, is part of our image, and it's very important. Part of the debate that takes place today regarding the branding, and I'm sure you talked about it, is where is the rebranding effective and where it's not. Uh, and the rebranding is effective in places that don't care much about the conflict. 
either they're they know little about it or they know little about Israel or they don't care much for it, then that could be very, very effective and it's great to widen the scope. As a friend of mine from the foreign ministry said, to add more dimensions to the way people talk about Israel. But for those who are actively engaged in the intellectual war in Israel, the fact that Tel Aviv is a great city makes absolutely no difference. If anything, you know that it's used geo-jitsu style against us. I'm sure you've all read the Pinkwash article in the New York Times, so Israel tries to come with this progressive image. You even hear people in the gay community in Israel saying do not cooperate with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Public Diplomacy when they're trying to present Israel as a progressive place for gays because blah, blah, blah. So for those places that are, shall we say, the Red Ocean, where the battle takes place, they're not interested that we're also innovative and that Tel Aviv is great. So there you do have to battle the old style battle, but you're absolutely right, I think that could to mention that, rebranding, and that is also part of the renaissance that I was talking about. The startup nation, the rebranding, is an opportunity to make new friends and to brand ourselves in places where before we were attacked, we didn't even bother to think about. Please. You do, they're just called the fascist parties and we don't like to recognize the fact that they love us so much. But that's, uh... <laughs> Well, um, first of all, you're right that there are some places, as I, as I mentioned, uh, that we must think in terms of our resources. Is it better to make better friends in India rather than trying to fight another battle in Berkeley or um, Zoas? But, um, but I do think that even in Europe, the situation is not static. Uh, everywhere, we need to understand that at the end of the day, those who are the committed fighters on the other side, they're few and far between. What makes them powerful is their ability to make alliances and that they fit with a certain intellectual atmosphere, especially in Europe, about the end of the national identity, about uh, a world without violence, and so forth. So you're absolutely right that as we fight this battle, we might say that we give up on some places, that they're hopeless, and we just put our resources elsewhere, we can make greater gains for the future. But even in those places that are difficult, we can always find ways to break those alliances and to find positions of weakness. Uh, I don't know if, uh, You've had a chance to see a report by Raoult about the last year on the delegitimacy campaign, citing some achievements. Some achievements in rolling back BDS efforts and rolling back some media campaigns. So one of the key things is really to fight this battle in every arena with the tools that are appropriate for every arena. So the tools that are appropriate for India might not be the tools that are appropriate for Berkeley, but ultimately it's a combination of fighting everywhere, but also knowing in some places that it's better to have our resources where we can make greater gains. Um, um, I'd like to say my opinion, I think that throughout history, the Western world has shown that uh, the pros are lobby and no matter you know, the walls and the peaks that have existed in that time period. 
But if I were to come with the from zooming into the Middle East as a whole, we see you know the true uh, enemies of Israel looking, you know, the people who you're saying we're looking to uh, prove the case that Israel does not have uh, right to self determination. When you look at them, you see, um, in terms of politically and organizationally, you see their inability to cooperate among themselves. And you also see uh, regime changes in very short periods of time. Do you think that, that the political issues and the uncooperative nature of these nations among themselves, is that a good enough uh, position? Is that an okay environment for Israel to exist? As opposed to, I mean, what's the other option? As opposed to, do you think that, um, you know, by, with their political issues, is Israel going to be able to sustain, um, sustain, you know, existing in this day and age? Um, well, we've certainly taken quite a challenge deciding to make a country here. I mean, there's, um, we could have chosen better regions. Unfortunately, this is where our historical homeland from the Bible is. Um, but, I'm sorry? This is not a monopoly or anything else. You can't just pick a point on the map and say, I'll start a country here. That's nice. That's what I'm saying. It, what I said was ironic. I, if the tone was not clear, then no, I'm sorry. It, it's, not, it's not like, I understood it's ironic, but the point is, uh, our guys here, as it says, is so binding due to the simple fact that we... I agree. As I said, I was using an ironic tone. That's, uh, that... We were, have taken quite the challenge, uh, and then, unfortunately this happens to be uh, where our, our uh, historical birthplace is. Israel should become far better in exploiting any divisions between our neighbors, any weaknesses. My personal assessment is that Israel is entering what uh, might be some of the best strategic periods of its history, but it will feel like the worst time. The reason that it will feel like the worst time is that all the anti-Semitism and the hatred towards Israel will come up to the fore. We will see it in constitutions, we will see it in movements, we will see it uh, voiced. But at the same time, our neighbors will be weaker. Uh, in many ways because they will be dealing with severe domestic challenges, internal turmoil, uh, some cases uh, civil war. And I think in that respect, uh, so far, the response of the government of Israel has been very wise, which has been to, as in Hebrew we say, to make the noise of a carpet, to, to absolutely be, you know, to be very quiet and to say nothing and to not intervene and to not be a party to any of it. And at the end of the day, this is probably the wisest policy. We need to build our strength still to build our military strength, build our, our legitimacy beyond the re region. I would even say begin to invest as a kind of seed money in uh, interreligious dialogue of um, various forms. If this is who our neighbors are going to be uh, going forward, we need to begin to think, maybe it's a crazy idea, but religious justifications from, for Zionism. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but I have some friends who are in the business of interreligious dialogues, and they always bring me like some Somali religious leaders who love Zionism and stuff like that. So uh, it sounds right now, um, you know, uh, a little crazy and on the side, but these are the kinds of things that you need to do to be innovative uh, in this war. And uh, I would even put some seed money into uh, ideas on interreligious dialogue. Please. Uh, you mentioned different types of solutions which you suggest. Say you had those 60 billion shekels, say you had all the budget that you need. What is the first project strategically that you would love? My first project. Uh, my first project would certainly be to go east. I would go full scale, India, China, east. Just make sure that Israel is beloved and supported in these places. And then I would go back and fight the wars in the UN, in the media, and our ambassadors, and all of that. But that is uh, by far would be my priority because that's I think that's where we have our window of opportunity. 
Right now, there's a window. Who knows, 10 years from now, if it will still be there. So uh, that's certainly where I would put all the money. Oh, please. Um, you're, when I'm listening to you, I feel like you're sending us all over the world defending Israel. But as a person who's been abroad defending Israel, mm -hmm. um, all the arguments that I hear come from people who read Gideon Levy, who study maybe with Shomo San, who quote Betzelen, and who vote red. So Who vote what? Red. Red, okay. Um, most of all green. Don't you think that the war of ideas should be led also here in Israel? You're absolutely right. Um, I forgot to mention it, but uh, absolutely one of the biggest problems in fighting this war is that on the other side, some of the most effective leaders of battalions on the other side are Jews or former Israelis or Israelis, period. Um, and this is something that we almost need to take as a given. Uh, I, we need to even remember that Herzl, when Herzl began promoting Zionism, his greatest foes by far were the Jews. So I guess that's almost a permanent fixture of uh, fighting for Zionism, that you need to do it against uh, some form of uh, Jewish and Israeli resistance. Uh, but putting that aside, and, that, and, and I don't deny it, it makes it very, very difficult to fight this battle. We do need also in Israel itself, when I talk about this renaissance of ideas, when I talk about this investment, I'll take part of it, what he said. The investment within Israel to remind people uh, about the history of Zionism, about the justice of the cause, because at the end of the day, people remember their short lives. They don't always have a historical perspective. And you're right that a big part of the battle has to be about us reclaiming Zionism here in Israel as well. Please. Yes, uh, two things. First of all, uh, I, I'm agreeing on the fact that we need to go east, we need to spread east. But the thing is, this country right now lives on a lot of money that comes from the West. I'll give the American aid. We know there's an exchange of ideals, information, and intelligence with the other Western uh, nations. If we leave those countries, we might not, because the money from the United States is not that clear right now with Obama. And it's not that what? Clear. It's not that clear. We, we will receive it for many years. In my mm, opinion. That's all. Mm -hmm. But investing in the, in the. The money comes from Congress, by the way, and only Congress. I know the money yeah. comes from Congress, but still, opinions do go mm -hmm. from the top down. And uh, the fact is, I think if we invest all that time in the East, that will be the ruling power within 20 years, the immediate state will be too, uh, will be far worse than what it is today. Mm -hmm. You're right in that respect. Specifically on the United States, we do need to remember, and that is also the greatest uh, response to people like uh, Walt and Mersheimer and all those who talk about the excessive force about the pro-Israel lobby to uh, dilute or to change or to work against the interests of the United States. Uh, the United States at the core, the American people, like Israel and are in favor of Israel. So when we work in the United States, it's true that we face challenges in progressive circles, but we do, we're not operating at the core at the very hostile environment. And the reason that as a message, I put my emphasis on the East, is just because the opportunity is so great for doing so little, and, and I do think it's a window of opportunity. But of course, the United States, the Europe, uh, they're critical. We need to at least maintain the support that we do have there. We need to do a lot of work with the younger generation of Jews. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that especially progressive Jews, increasingly in the younger generation especially, increasingly distance themselves from Israel. They either distance themselves from Israel passively, by just wanting to have nothing to do with it, or actively. Uh, like you mentioned, by going against Israel and showing their anti-Israel credentials in progressive circles. And I must say that 
Increasingly, what I'm concerned about is that I think it's a social acceptability choice. And I know this might sound a little controversial, but in social and progressive circles, Israel has obviously lost its, uh, its standing as a progressive cause. And in progressive circles, a lot of Jews belong to those progressive circles. And in order to feel comfortable socially, um, anti-Israel positions are the ones that are socially acceptable. So to be accepted, to feel comfortable, uh, you find yourselves adopting those positions. I can tell you that I've seen this slow transformation with friends of mine who have left for academias in the US. Uh, some of them who started as your, you know, even your classic labor Zionists in Israel, when you started implanting them in very left-wing academia in America, within a few years, you find them adopting very, very leftist critical stance, and that I would say would border and sometimes beyond border on anti-Zionism. And I think there is a very powerful tool here of social acceptability that is, um, that is at work, and, and we need to, to do a lot of work to fight that as well. Please. You talked about Zionism and the fact that we explained it like uh, it was in the book about Herzl. And um, today I think there's something in the way Israeli, some Israelis use Zionism is, is a notion that we accept, it, which is uh, controversial. We understand that Israel is supposed to be a Jewish state and also a democratic state. So we know that there's problems with, with the notion of Zionism. So why? You're telling us to, to paint it really, to, to paint it and, and say it how we feel about Zionism, but the way Israelis use it around the world can be um, understood, understood for somewhat as racist uh, regarding our, our uh, relationship to the country and the way we want to keep it. And that is absolutely our failure. Uh, our failure is that we have not been able to remind ourselves and the world of what Zionism is all about. I'm not talking about painting it, I'm talking about what it is all about. And I see that problem in Israel as well. For example, and that also goes to the question over there about the Bible. It is increasingly difficult to find uh, secular speakers in Israel for Zionism. Uh, and that is very, very difficult because to make the religious case for Zionism does not fly. Uh, not in Europe, not in certain places in the United States. And the case for Zionism at the core, even though it was a historical base, was not a religious case. And if you read the Declaration of Independence of Israel, the Megillat Etzmoh, the word democracy is not mentioned. And yet the fact that the word democracy is not mentioned does not mean that it is not a superb document of progressive values. But it just couches those values in the language of our prophets and our culture and our history. And we have failed in many ways to preserve that and to remind people that the core of Zionism was to say that Jews are not only a religion. You can be, as I happen to be, an atheist Jew and a very committed one. And we have lost the ability to make that argument, to remind people that Judaism is a civilization, it's a people. And as a people, we have the right to self-determination, to the expression of our values, and our symbols, and our history, and our culture, and the public sphere. And we have too quickly surrendered the argument because it's difficult. Being Jewish is difficult, period. And making arguments that have to do with the unique nature of Judaism are difficult as well. But we have to insist on it because I've seen people too easily give up on the fact that Zionism was not about having a state for ethnic Jews. 
It was about having a place where the Jewish people can express their sovereignty and that the Jewish people are akin to, I don't know, how should we say, I mean, they're a people, they're not a religion. And the fact that the homeland of the Jewish people is Israel doesn't mean that there's no place there for those who are not Jews, but it is a country that has a purpose to be the expression, the national expression of Jewish history. And, and we have that right, and that right should not be denied us. Yes? Yeah. We, we, we have that. Yeah. Yeah, we won't accept anyone else. Yeah. So, so we, we, we do accept other people just by a different process. Different process. Yeah. So you were saying that the country is for Jews, and that's a whole problematic with, 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 with the Jewish state. Again, that's where we give up on the more complex argument. Ehud Bar uh, no, sorry, Aaron Barak uh, said very beautifully, once said, he said, uh, in Israel we are all equal, but the keys to getting here do not by essence need to be distributed equally. And that is the right that every country has to decide who enters and why, what are the criteria for who enters. And I know that we often compare ourselves to America or America's immigration policy, but America is the unique creation, not Israel. The fact that countries want to have um, a place where they have a certain cultural homogeneity, where their history and their culture is respected, is not racist. Uh, it is the right of a community, the right of a people to have communal expression as well as individual expression. And the notion of communal expression is not racist. Please. Do you think maybe a good way to, to look at the situation of people delegitimizing Jews as a people, to maybe reframe it as uh, the people of Israel rather than Jews themselves? You know, because historically we've known... Of course, I mean, it, we are Jews. Uh, Noah here likes to make that argument, is that we are Jews because we come from Judea, and uh, we are the people of Judea. Uh, so, yeah, we... So to use look, that as a tool to, to reframe in the political sphere. Look, but I sometimes... Um, I mean, it, it's a nice tool, but um, I think at the end of the day, what I ask a lot of people who are not Jews and who come to Israel, who try to understand Israel, I ask them something very hard. I ask them not to try to understand Israel and Judaism on their own terms, especially if they're European or American or Western European and American, uh, and they have their own notions of separation of church and state that have developed from the Roman Christian uh, tradition of Pope and uh, Caesar. We, I tell them, look, Judaism is different, and you need to understand it on its own unique basis. One metaphor that I often use is uh, Judaism is a multifaceted diamond that has numerous faces, historic, ethnic, religious, cultural, and national, of course, civilizational. And you cannot take just one facet of the diamond and say that is Judaism. And because Judaism is so multifaceted, it allows for weird creations such as an atheist Jew. And I can tell you that in a recent parliamentary visit to Germany, when I mentioned to my colleagues that I am an atheist, he said, then you're not Jewish. And except for the fact that he said it to me, which was, was I thought, a little rude. Uh, he, for him, it was a complete impossibility. So it creates, modernity created something weird as an atheist Jew, as well as Jews against Zionism, which is what you find in Google when you look for Zionism at the top 10. And all of these exist. There are those who think that Zionism is heresy because we went against the Messiah and tried to do it now rather than wait. And there are those who, like me, who don't believe in God but are truly and deeply committed to the Jewish people and believe in the importance of the Jewish people and their future. So we ultimately, that's our, uh, pardon the pun, our cross to bear, that Judaism is a unique creation that does not lend itself to easy categories. 
And that is in many ways why we drive people crazy for quite a few centuries by now. Please. I think that's going to be the last question, right? Uh, the question of settlement is one that is always by the point difficult when, uh, when you go to speak abroad. I come from labor Zionism. I'm no big supporter of the settlement project. I don't think that it was Israel's wisest policy. But when I talk about winning the argument, I do think that as part of going to the roots, we need to remind people whether it is the Bible or whether it is the mandate of the League of Nations that was never revoked, is that we do have the right to settle in the West Bank until an alternative sovereignty is established there. And the, and the League of Nations, by the way, never talked about an alternative sovereignty to be mentioned there. And because the UN Resolution 181 was rejected, it's also still not in force. The only thing that is legally enforced in the West Bank is the mandate of the League of Nations, later reaffirmed by the United Nations, that gives the Jewish people the mandate to settle the area between the Jordan River and, uh, and the Mediterranean. So I think we do need to make the argument that this is absolutely our right. Uh, but I politically make the argument that it was not wise for us to exercise that right. So, okay, I will, uh, I'll take this last uh, last question and then uh, we'll just two parting words. Yes. So, you mentioned that um, instead of arguing about who's the victim, you should divert the argument to the fact that Israel is a democracy and... Uh, and responsibility, yeah. Yeah, and uh, how they've prospered in the region, etc. But uh, how do we... Uh, how should we how do we cope with this when you've got the likes of Hillary Clinton uh, only focusing on on a bad point such as on our what? what on the bad point such as what's going on with the uh, religious sector and uh, the um, the price tag price taggers mm -hmm. yeah so how do we how do we make this argument when you've got such influential people like Hillary Clinton only focusing on the bad. Well, just to be fair, uh, I actually think that Hillary Clinton does not only focus on that when it comes to Israel. That, that's a, that is a recent... I'm sorry? That, was, that, that happened quite recently. Oh, I'm sure, I know very well what happened. I'm just saying, if you look at Hillary Clinton's relationship to Israel, uh, you could truly not fault her for being someone who focuses on what's wrong with us. And Hillary Clinton is someone who is deeply concerned about women. And I, and I talked with her staff and they said, look, you noticed what she had to say about Israel. We can tell you as her staff that she talks about women everywhere in the world all the time. And this is, for me, the mark of whether someone's being fair or not. If someone takes an issue, such as uh, the treatment of women, and they bring it up whether it's about China, or whether it's in Israel, or whether what's happening to the status of women in the Arab world, then legitimately, and I know she's a friend of Israel, and she loves Israel, and she's a great supporter of Israel, as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy to live with that. It's not, I don't view that, I would certainly put her, as I say, well within the tent, because she stands with, I mean, the two criteria, one, a long-standing support of Israel, and two, the issue of women she raises regarding many, many countries we just don't notice when she talks about it in other contexts. So we do need to be able to, to differentiate between those who are our friends and are raising concerns as friends, and that's perfectly fine, and those uh, who, under the guise of criticism, are absolutely doing nothing that has Israel's interests in mind because they show no such passion for human rights anywhere outside of Israel. They have never proved themselves as supporters of Israel. Then you can clearly identify someone 
who's really on the side of those that we need to battle. Hillary Clinton is really, really not there. So um, I'll just end by saying that um, I do hope that you all become great ambassadors and your mission, uh, should you wish to accept it, is to be excellent soldiers and commanders in the IIDF and to win the War of Ideas because I truly believe that with your help and with that of a lot of many committed people, we can win. Thank you.